Praise the Lord. Today again I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell me, how many of you know that there is a way that you can have prosperity in everything that you do? Well, for those of you who don't know the way, I want you to pay close attention to the teaching you're about to hear. Today we're going to take an in-depth study of Psalms chapter 1. But before we get into the actual study, I want to talk just for a few minutes about the entire Psalter, that you may become more familiar with the various books, uh, the writers, and the general content. Okay, so we begin. Uh, as we all know that the book of Psalms uh, contain 150 chapters. And these chapters were divided into five books, each book having its own benediction. Book number five, however, has its benediction, but it also has a doxology for the entire Psalter. So here's a quick analysis of the five books. Book number one is made up of 41 chapters, and it was written mainly by David. The predominant divine name that is used for the Lord is Yahweh, while most of the topics are centered on human and creation. Now, if you were uh, looking for a book in the Old Testament that would be similar, we would choose the book of Genesis. Now, book number two has 31 chapters. And again, it was written mainly by David and the sons of Korah. The predominant divine name is El Elohim. And unlike the first book, the topics are about deliverance and redemption, which makes this book similar to the book of Exodus. Book number three is somewhat shorter, having only 17 chapters. And it was written mainly by Asaph who also referred to God as El Elohim. Worship and, and the sanctuary is the main theme, which seems to coincide with the book of Leviticus. Book number four also has 17 chapters, but no one knows the name of the author. Whoever it was, that person did refer to the Lord as Yahweh. The topic is mainly about uh, wilderness and God's ways, uh, which makes it similar in many ways to the book of Numbers. And finally, we have book number five uh, with 44 chapters. Uh, and it was written again mainly by David and, and someone else. Uh, the name we don't really know. The predominant divine name uh, again here is Yahweh, meaning the Lord. Now, in this book resemble the book of Deuteronomy because it focuses on God's word and praise. Now, now you have a better idea of how the book of Psalms is divided and the main focus of each book. Now, one other interesting point that you may want to take note of is, is about the longest and the shortest chapters in the Bible. It makes for good uh, quiz. The book of Psalms is the longest book in the Bible. It has the longest chapter in the Bible. Chapter uh, 119 which has 176 verses. It also has the shortest chapter in the Bible. Chapter 117 which has only two verses. And again you know while we're talking about the shortest and the longest chapter may I just say that um, the shortest book in the Bible is 3rd John having 14 verses and uh, those verses comprise of 294 words. Again, the longest verse in the Bible is in uh, Esther chapter 8 verse 9 which has 90 words. But listen to this, the shortest verse in the Bible is John 11:35 with two very important words Jesus wept well I hope all this was meaningful and I pray that God would you know open your heart to receive all that he has for you today I pray this in Jesus name now let's begin Psalms chapter 1 you know if you had to give this chapter a title perhaps you can call it the way of the righteous Psalms chapter 1 begins, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, 
nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law that he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now let's analyze this psalm verse by verse, beginning at verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The first thing we notice is that the writer is set out to describe the things that the blessed man does not practice. He makes reference to three specific things. One, he does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Two, he does not stand in the way of sinners. And three, he does not sit in the seat of the scornful. Let's look at these three one by one. What does it mean to walk in the counsel of the ungodly? Well, if we take the statement without trying to read anything into it, we could say it means that the blessed person does not conduct his or her life according to the counsel and dictates of people who oppose the teaching and doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul describes these people as enemies of the cross. Philippians 3, 17 to 19 says, listen to this. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Bless man, my friend, he must walk according to the dictates of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Romans 8.14 says. It says that, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. The Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you into all truth. That's what Jesus said. The blessed man has a path to follow and a specific way to walk. And he has to walk according to the will of God. Ephesians 5, 15 to 17 says, look, listen to what it says. It says, see then that he walks circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The blessed man walks in the light because he has, he has come to know that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. For as John uh, 1, 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. You know, if we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Even Jesus, when he was confronted by the Pharisees in John 8, 12, he says, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is the story, my friend, of the blessed man. And there is more. But I want to bring these three action back to your attention walk stand and sit that's that's the position of this of this uh, uh, man isn't that the way it is before a person gets involved in in some kind of situation that could you know lead him astray isn't that what happens you know you're walking and 
and you notice some some ungodly behavior so instead of instead of turning the other way you continue in that direction and become enticed so now you stand to have a closer look by this time loss is conceived and it, it draws you to that sitting position that's basically how it works you know but I'm I'm here today to remind you and also to tell you uh, you know I, I want you to know my friend I want you to be aware that the Word of God addresses all of these situations if you open your Bibles to Proverbs uh, chapter 1 and look at verses 10 to 15 this is what this is what you read the father is speaking to the son he says my son if sinners entice thee consent thou not if they say come come with us you know let us lay wait for blood let us look privily for the innocent without cause let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as though you know uh, those that go down to the pit you know and we shall find all kinds of precious substance we'll fill our houses with spoil you know casting that lot with us let us all have one purse my son he says walk not down the way with them refrain thy foot from their path the father warns don't do it don't go with it you're walking down the street and you see a situation that does not look uh, a like godly a safe situation turn just turn and walk the other way Proverbs 4 26 27 it gives further instruction about your walk it says ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established turn not to the right nor to the left remove thy foot from evil my friend look don't be ignorant when it comes to the ungodly he or she is naughty and wicked you know and the reward is at their doorstep and we ought to be extremely careful when we encounter such a person for they can be very very crafty don't 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 be naive you can get trapped listen to what the Word of God says about this type of individual it says that a naughty person is a wicked man he walking with a frown uh, a mouth you know he winking with his eyes and he's speaking with his feet and he teaches with his fingers Frowardness is in his heart. He devises mischief continually. He saw a discord. Therefore, you know, his calamity comes quickly and it comes suddenly. You know, suddenly he shall be broken without remedy. And the Bible goes on to say that these six things that the Lord hate. You, know, you, you, you think it's easy? Yeah. Seven is an abomination unto him. Listen to what the Lord hates, man. A proud look, a lying tongue hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imagination, feet a swift running into mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Proverbs 6, 12 to 19. This, you know, the Lord hates these things. When the Lord Jesus Christ came here and began to preach the kingdom of God, the good news, you know, he teach us that we must refrain from these things. You know, my friend, up until this point, we have only touched on the subject of walking. You know, there is more. There's much more to say. You know, but I think you've you, you've gotten the message. You know, so let's just let's move on to standing and let's see what we have. You know, the moment you find yourself standing in the way of sinners, it won't be long before you find yourself sitting in the seat of the scornful. Surely this is not the practice of the blessed man. The Apostle Paul addressed the Galatians concerning ungodly practices. You know, practices like idolatry, witchcraft, strife, envying murder, you know, just to name a few. You know, he said that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5. You know, and if, if you really examine the word do, in the Greek is praso, which means practice. The blessed man does not practice such things. You know, he's not to stand in the way of sinners, but he's to stand on the word of God, and furthermore, he is to stand against the wiles of the devil. Again, to the Ephesian, the apostle Paul addressed this situation. Ephesians six ten, you know, he tells them how to prepare ourselves to stand in the times of adversity. 
in his address to these Ephesians, here's what he says. And I want you to pay close attention. I mean, this is serious stuff here. You know, don't think you just go out there on your own and try to, to you know, to, to tackle this devil. We know that, uh, that, that Jesus defeated the devil when, when Jesus went on the cross, died for our sins. But the devil has, he has some tricks. You know, he has some tricks up his sleeve. The Apostle Paul said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He says, Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. That's what it is. He goes on to say that, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He says, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, all of it, that you may be able to withstand in the evil they haven't done all. He says, stand. After having done all, you've got to stand. He says, stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and, and, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, whereby you're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And then take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And my friend, don't forget, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You've got to have faith in this. You must stand and hold your ground. Be not afraid, for the Lord is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you, and God had not given you a spirit of fear. My friend, when it comes to sitting, just think of what the Bible says concerning you and the Lord. Hearing is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. Did you hear that? As he, Jesus, is right now, so are we in this world. First John 4, 17. Jesus is standing at the right hand of God, Acts 7, 56. And that's the position we ought to take. You'll also find him seated at the right hand of God the Father with all power in heaven and on earth. Ephesians 2, 6 says, and God had raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My friend, did you hear that? We've got power. We've got blessings. You know, we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Everything, my friend, I want you to remember this. And this is very, very important. Everything about you is in Christ Jesus. Remember that. Take nothing, no praise for yourself. Everything about you comes through Christ Jesus. So now we can we can walk circumspectly. You know, we can stand firmly and with confidence. We can sit knowing that He's our protector. And as He is, so are we in this world. How are we? We are more than conquerors, deeply loved and highly favored. Praise the Lord. That's how we are. You know, there are other ways that a man can be blessed. And the blessing is also from the Lord. Know that. Take a look at these, these scriptures. And you know, you may want to jot them down. They're important. Psalms 41 and 1. What does it say? It says, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. Psalms 84. 4 to 5 says, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee, Salah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them. Psalms 94, 12 says, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. When God teaches you, man, there ain't no teacher better than the Holy Spirit. Now let's look at uh, the second verse of this psalm. Verse 
number two talks about preoccupation it talks about the preoccupation of the blessed man it says his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law that he meditate day and night that's that's the blessed man and that's why he's blessed because his preoccupation is is in the word of, in the word of the Lord day and night he's thinking about it you know he's, he's bringing it up he's considering it he's memorizing it he's meditating on this word and to meditate means you know you read it and then uh, you, you, you bring it back up and you look at it and you, you you know you talk about it talk about the Lord Lord what are you saying to me in this verse, in this scripture, you know, does it ring the bell? As for me, most of the time I find myself drawn to my place of study. I just wanna, I just wanna get into the word, you know. You know, it's not a, an obsession, but it, it, it's an affection, a fascination, it's an attraction that I have. Just like Jesus said in John 12, 32. He said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men to me. And that's what it is. I'm drawn to the Lord because the Lord he is the Word of God John 1 1 that's what I'm drawn to it it's a it's a divine magnetism of the word and it was draws me to that secret place where I can meditate and, and worship and, and you know praise the Lord and I'm sure a lot of you out there uh, uh, are doing the same thing you meditate and you're drawn to that word because the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit that, that lives in you, he, he wants to talk about Jesus. He wants to show you things. You see, that's what, that's, that's what it is. Yeah, you know, there is nothing more rewarding than to be in the presence of the Lord. For in His presence, my friend, there is fullness of joy. There's gladness in the presence of the Lord. Verse 3 is about a very remarkable comparison listen to this it says that and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he do it shall prosper did you hear that did you hear that the blessed man may I may I say the Christian or perhaps I, I need to define it even more by saying the son of God the child of God as mentioned in John 1 12 you know it's not only uh, he, he's not only like a, a, a tree planted by the rivers of living water but according to Jesus out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water you know and this is documented in John 7 37 the story Jesus he's at the feast of tabernacles the Bible says uh, in in the last day that great day of the feast Jesus stood up and cried saying if any man thirst let him come unto me. Let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39 says, But this speak he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is, this is the profile of the blessed man. And if yours is not the same as his, then you need to, to, to do a makeover. You need, you, you, need to, you need to be born again. Just as Jesus said, you must be born again. And you say, if you don't know, if you're not born again, I'll tell you how at the end of the program. Now, there are some trees, as we were talking about, uh, that appear to be flourishing. They're full of leaves, yet they do not bring forth fruit in their season. As a matter of fact, this is something that actually happened. Listen to the story in Mark, Mark 11, verse 12 to 14. Here's Jesus. He's walking along the way. And Bible says that on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Hey, Jesus does get hungry, you know. He's human, you know. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came. And you know, hoping that he might find uh, something on it. And and you know, when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of fakes was not yet. What is it doing with leaves, my friend? And Jesus answered and said unto it. Now this is, when I read this, it struck me. Jesus answered and he said unto it. 
seems like the fig tree might have said something for Jesus to answer and he said no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever and his disciples heard it Jesus was having a conversation with the fig tree my friend you know and in the morning as they passed by they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots and Peter calling to remembrance he said unto him master behold the fig tree which thou cursed it is withered away oh yeah blessed is the man who does not fit that profile but is like the tree planted by the river of water that bring it forth its fruit in its season now there's one more element in verse 3 and uh, that is very significant and is very important to his well-being and that's prosperity now you know whenever the word prosperity is mentioned you know some some tend to make an association with money but prosperity is not just about money only it, you know it's about all that life has to offer third john says third john verse one and two says uh, the elders unto the well beloved gaius whom i love in the truth beloved i wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in hell even as thy soul prospered you see so here we see the man's soul prospering, laughter, joy, happiness, all these. He's prospering, you know. How would you, how would you, for instance, I just want to make this clear. I want you to understand that prosperity is not just about money. I want to open your imagination this morning so that you can come up, so that you can think. I want you to explore how would you evaluate Isaiah 54 17 which says no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper and every town that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me saith the Lord how does a weapon prosper weapons are designed to kill does that put killing and prosperity in the same category? I said all that just to, you know, as I want you to get, I want to get you thinking, my friend, thinking about the idea of prosperity. Open your mind, expand your vision, you know, and don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. The wicked also seem to achieve prosperity. Listen to Psalm 73, Asap wrote. He says, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Did you hear that? Asap said that he saw the prosperity of the wicked. The wicked seek prosperity at any cost, which is not consistent with the word of God. Proverbs 1.10 you know, speaks of the wicked, the sinner, and his method of achieving prosperity. I think we read it before, but it's good to hear it again. He says, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us look privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. That's what they do, you know. But my friend, listen, let me tell you this. There is a reward for the wicked. Mark 8, 36, Jesus warns, For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Let it be clear that it is the Lord who empowers the blessed man to prosper. You know the story about Joseph? Genesis uh, 39 says, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hands. It's the Lord, my friend. It's the Lord that gives you that power, that wisdom. It's the Lord that causes you to prosper in the way that he wants. 
Now the next three verses are mainly about the ungodly. Three verses we talked about the godly, the blessed man. Now here we're going to talk about the ungodly. Now we see one, a comparison. Two, we see consequences. And three, we see reward. Verse four. Take verse four. It lightens the ungodly to chaff. It says the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drive it away. My friend, listen. The Bible doesn't particularly have anything good to say about chaff. And likewise the ungodly. Here are just a few things. If we look at the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 24 says, The flame consumeth the chaff. <laughs> Talks about the flames consuming the chaff, the ungodly like chaff. Matthew 3, 11 speaks of, of Jesus and, and, and what he will do to the chaff. 3.11, verse 11, this is I. It says, I, John, indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with power. This is John the Baptist. He's talking to everybody there about the coming of Jesus. Jesus is the baptizer. He's the one that will baptize them uh, in the Holy Ghost. John was baptizing with water. But Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Verse 12 says, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The ungodly, remember, is lighting on to chaff. They're going to be burnt up with unquenchable fire. So who's, who, who's lighting on to the chaff? You're right. It's the ungodly. Verse 5. Verse 5 talks about consequences. It says, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Yeah. This verse definitely points to an outcome on the day of judgment. In other words, the ungodly doesn't stand a chance on the day of judgment because it's too late. It's too late to repent. Salvation is now and it's for the living that they may have the opportunity to spend all of eternity with our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. On that day forward, not a single sinner will be found in the congregation of those who have been made righteous by the blood of Christ. There will be no place for such, for they have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Second Peter 2.9 says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly of the temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. On the day of judgment, they're going to be punished. There is no more hope, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-will. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Oh man. Verse 12 says, But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things they, they don't even understand, you know, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption should receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that counted pleasure to riot in the daytime. Here's what he says. He says, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They're hypocrites, my friend, having eyes full of adultery, you know, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. A heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children they are. There's nothing good to say about these people. Verse 17 says, These are, uh, are whales without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Hey man, there is nothing good about this ungodly. There's nothing good about them. These ones that reject the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend. You know. And finally we have verse 6. And that's about the reward of both the righteous and the ungodly. It says, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You know, for the righteous, the way 
is Jesus Christ. For he proclaimed openly, John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father but by me. For the ungodly, the way is hell, where the fire burns forever. Jesus talked about it when he told the story about the rich man and Lazarus. Luke 16. Listen to verse 22. It says, And it came to pass that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died. He was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. Oh man, there is a place called hell, and it's reserved for these ungodly sinners who reject our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, anyone who has rejected what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, I'm telling you, they'll be in, 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 in hell for eternity, my friend. There's no hope for them. My friend, but I'm, let, let me tell you this. There is hope for everyone who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because we were all sinners. And the message, the call went out. The call went out. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever should believe would have everlasting life. The call went out, you see. And this might be your opportunity if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, and, and don't let it go by, my friend. The devil wants to tell you that you've got time. You can do this tomorrow. But you see, salvation is now. Salvation is now. And you don't want to pass this opportunity. Don't do it, my friend. The Bible says in John 1, 12, But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. I'm telling you, my friend, this is a, a wonderful opportunity. Romans 5, 5 says, And hope make it not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. You see, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You know, scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My friend, today is your day. God loves you and he wants to bless you. He wants to bless you right now. God loves you. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever, whosoever, are you a whosoever? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, my friend. Listen to me. If you haven't received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, my friend, this is a wonderful opportunity you don't want to let go by. And Romans 10.9 is the key to a new beginning for you. If you haven't received Jesus Christ, this is what it says. That if thou will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. My friend, if you have made a positive decision in your heart right now to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I want you to say this prayer with me. It's the prayer of faith. Just say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. I acknowledge that I am a sinner and I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord of my life. And that he died for my sins and rose again from the dead. I accept him right now as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me a child of God. Precious Lord, 
I've heard the message. I've heard the word. I've heard about the love of God. And according to your word, as written in Romans 10, 9, I declare right now that I am saved. And I thank you for it, precious Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, help me to walk this Christian walk. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.